Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming tonight for our Sunday feast gathering. You can now all turn and face this seat. We'll now have a talk from 6 until 7. Now tonight's talk will be given by Govardhana Das Brahmachari. Here he is. Many of you know Govardhan, but for those of you who don't, I know some might be here for the first time, Govardhan has been practicing Krishna consciousness for several years, but he's been serving in the Brahmachari Ashram, living here at the temple for, um, this is now his fifth year living here, and he takes care, he cares for the deities uh, on the altar, but also his primary service is going out throughout San Diego and other places, and he tries to share books about Krishna, Bhagavad Gita and other books by Srila Prabhupada. So tonight he'll give the talk, and he told me his talk is something about investments and retirement. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Here he is. Also, one other thing is, Sheila made the nice point that um, this bhajan or song we're just about to sing, many may not be familiar with the words, so I do have at least four copies of the words and the translation, so if four people would like to, they could use these and give them back to Nelson afterward. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Janava Lava Giri Vadhari Jaya Gopi Janava Lava Giri Vadhari Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari
कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Pijana Vala Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada.
प्रभुपाद की थैंक यू टू जो मनी प्रभु ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So today I'll be reading from Shrimad Bhagavad Gita, as it is. If you guys want to follow along, it's uh, chapter eight, text eight. It's called "Attaining the Supreme." Abhyasa yoga yogte na chaita sa nanyagamina paramam purusham divyam yati parta nu chintayan. Translation. He or she who meditates on me as the supreme personality of Godhead, his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated from the path he, O Partha, is sure to reach me. Purport. In this verse, Lord Krishna stresses the importance of remembering him. One's memory of Krishna is revived by chanting the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna. By this practice of chanting and hearing, the sound vibration of the Supreme Lord, one's ear, tongue, and mind are engaged. This mystic meditation is very easy to practice, and it helps one attain the Supreme Lord. Purusham means enjoyer. Although living entities belong to the marginal energy of the Supreme Lord, they are in material contamination. They think themselves enjoyers, but they are not the Supreme Enjoyer. Here it is clearly stated that the Supreme Enjoyer is the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his different manifestations and plenary expansions as Narayan, Vasudeva, etc. The devotee can constantly think of the object of worship, the Supreme Lord, in any of his features, Narayan, Krishna, Ram, etc., by chanting Hare Krishna. This practice will purify him, and at the end of his life, due to his constant chanting, he will be transferred to the kingdom of God. Yoga practice in, is meditation on the, super, on the super soul within. Similarly, by chanting Hare Krishna, one fixes his mind always on the Supreme Lord. The mind is fickle, and therefore it is necessary to engage the mind by force <clears throat> to think of Krishna. One example often given is that of the caterpillar that thinks of becoming a butterfly and so is transformed into a butterfly in the same life. Similarly, if we constantly think of Krishna, it is certain that at the end of our lives, we shall have the same bodily constitution as Krishna. Oma jnana timarandasya jnananjana shalakaya chakshurin militam yena tasmai shri gurve namaha shri chaitanya mano bishtam stapitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadam mayam dadati swapadantikam vandeham shri guru shri utapadakamalam shri guru and vaisnavamsha shri rupam sagrajatam sahagana ragunatan vitam tam sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabando Jagarpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namasati Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavanishri Vrishabhana Sutta Devi Haripanan Haripri Vancha Kalpatri Bhishcha Kripasana Bhavacha Patitanam Pavane Bio, Vaishna Bio, Namo Namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Antyananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Ivasari Gaura Bhakta Vinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <clears throat> you know, growing up, I had a fear of speaking. And right before I give class, I always have this feeling like, who here has ridden a roller coaster? You know, most of us in the West. And you know how we, 
it's like going to the top. And all of a sudden, that drop, like, that's how I'm feeling right now. So please excuse me if I'm a little, uh, you know. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the Hare Krishna movement, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, he used this, um, this saying, the struggle for existence. Struggle for existence. So now I would like to uh, engage the audience. Can anyone tell me what comes to mind when this phrase comes up? Struggle for existence. Please raise your hand and if we can pass the mic. The struggle for existence. Trying to pay the outrageous rates in Pacific Beach. <laughs> rents, the outrageous rents. Okay. That's a struggle. Thank you, Dravira Prabhu. Dhanavari Mataji. Hare Krishna, thank you. Uh, what I'm thinking right now is uh, extra endeavor for to, in, to gain material possession or so many things. We endeavor uh, so much and then we get, we are suffering uh, in that process because we, it's good to you know, make an effort, but we do so much that mm -hmm. we forget the spirituality or the... Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Matsuji? Welcome, by the way. So when you hear struggle for existence, what do you think of? I think of the war inside your mind where you don't want to die, but you don't necessarily want to live. Mm. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Anyone else? Monday morning. Monday morning. <laughs> Monday morning. You know, outside the parking lot, there's a sticker on one of the um, vehicles there. And it says, existence is pain. You know, the Buddhists, that's why they reject this material world. They understand that just by living is the cause of our suffering. And Dhanavari Mataji, she pointed out, we over-endeavor to get material things in order to be happy. There's a nice example that Srila Prabhupada uses. A camel, it loves to chew on thorns. You know, thorns. And when it chews on thorns, its tongue, it, it gets poked, it gets ripped apart. And this camel loves the taste of its own blood mixed with the thorns. So similarly, a lot of people, they over-endeavor to get things. In actuality, it's suffering, but they think themselves to be enjoying. <clears throat> For example, people work very hard in this world, day and night. You know, I have a cousin that's part of the military, and he lives near IB, Imperial Beach, and he has to drive all the way to Camp Pendleton. Does anyone know how far that is? It's like, it's like one hour. But due to traffic, it takes him two hours. His back hurts, you know, he has, a, he has two kids, he doesn't see them. And of course, we're not rejecting uh, the responsibilities of family life, but we over-endeavor, you know. There's a saying that in the past, we used to love people and use things. Now we love things and we use people. We put so much emphasis on material things. I was driving back here to uh, the temple from book distribution. And there's a billboard here on, um, I think it's Ingraham. And it said, get paid a day early. That, that's, how, yeah, that's how much people are struggling in this world. You know, they're just, they can't pay their rent. You know, there's this and that. I was at Bobo Park a few years ago, and I asked, a gentleman, I said, excuse me, sir. Without even asking a question, the first thing he said, I'm just an ordinary person trying to get my rent paid. That's the first thing, <laughs> that's the first thing he said. And I was thinking, wow, like, you know, before Krishna consciousness, I would have been in that same boat, you know. Um, my spiritual teacher, His Holiness Badrinarayan Swami Maharaj, he uses this example, and it's very prominent. 
He says, if you have a bucket full of water and you put your hand in there, what happens to the water line? It goes up. What happens if you take your hand back out? It goes back down to the very same spot. So he said, do we want to live in this world just taking up space? And then after leaving this world, what did we really have to show for? What do we leave behind? So I thought it was an appropriate um, example. And the reason why I'm giving this uh, class is because of Nelson Prabhu, one of my good friends. During the Krishna Lounge, Balaram Prabhu gave a, a class. And Nelson Prabhu said, oh, I heard that something like, um, I heard that the benefits of practicing Krishna consciousness, um, the reward is out of this world. Do you remember you saying that? Can you get a mic, please? Everybody should hear this. <laughs> Can you repeat that again, Nelson? Sure, I asked Balaram Prabhu if um, on the spiritual path in Krishna consciousness, if the retirement plan was out of this world. <laughs> and I thought that was a very nice, clever um, statement by Nelson Prabhu. So we should make spiritual investment. You know, everyone's making investment, you know, stock markets, Wall Street. And people think that's what the goal of life is. That people don't know that the actual goal of life is to please Krishna, to understand Krishna. There's a story of a beggar. And he went to a foreign country. And in this country, they had a very strange tradition. Every five years, they would have a new king, a new king. And how they would do it, they would have an elephant with a garland. And he would just p pick a random person. So this uh, elephant was on his way. And he saw this beggar resting under a tree. And he put the garland on him. So then it was a big celebration, you know. He was put on the throne. And then this new king, he saw the opulence of the kingdom, you know. Unlimited servants to attend to you. Your military, the infantry, the soldiers, they're all there underneath you. Not only that, but you can imagine, you know, the riches and opulence. But one day, there was this old wise man, and he told him, see, young man, there's a rule of this island. After five years, you are um, expelled, or uh, what's the right word? Huh? Deposed or um, there's another word. Huh? What was that? Exiled. Exiled to a unmaintained island. And there's ferocious animals there. So he said, this life of yours, this enjoyment is temporary. So he began thinking and meditating on this. So he asked the old man, what should I do? And the old man said, Rule the kingdom as best as you can, you know, do pious um, activities, good welfare work, and help the, the um, citizens advance in spiritual life. And he said, not only that, but send soldiers to this island, you know, put fence around it, start developing it. So this new king, he took the words of the old man very seriously, and that's what he did. So after five years, they expelled or exiled this king to the foreign island. And then it turned out to be paradise, you know. So similarly, we should make investments in the next life. This life is temporary. Everyone can understand that. You know, today a person may be a very rich person, and then the next day can be a pauper on the street. So what do we have to be so proud of? I was uh, distributing books. I'm sorry, I, I love book distribution. And who here doesn't have this book, Bhagavad Gita? You, know, you guys are all pure devotees here. Yeah. <laughs> but the Bhagavad Gita is not just the book, but it's very practical. Like Krishna describes the mind, like what Smataji was saying. All of us are dealing with the mind internally. And the mind we live every we live with every day. 
the, the mind is not like a roommate, you know, where you can kick out, you know. We live with the mind. And sometimes the mind is very strong and it pulls us to very strange directions. Um, I recently heard that one of our uh, congregation members, um, he's no longer here with us. And that's due to the mind, you know. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, for one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, the mind remains his greatest enemy. So the mind needs to be controlled. And in the verse I was talking about, it said, just meditate on Krishna. And in this age, it's so easy. We just simply have to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Anyone can chant this anywhere. There's no restriction. There was a cartoon, and Srila Prabhupada, um, the, this old man was telling the wife, chant, chant, chant. And then the Mataji, the wife, she was saying, can't, can't, can't. <laughs> so the mind, the mind is a non-devotee. It deviates us from the, from the path of devotional service. The mind pulls us in so many ways. And sometimes Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that one of the roaming senses can pull away even a person's intelligence. And out of the senses, the chief is the mind. The mind is controlling all the different uh, senses. So um, I was distributing books, and I was telling this one person about the mind. I asked him, how's your mind treating you? And his friend said, tell him, Joe, tell him. And then so Joe, he said, my mind is going a million miles per hour. Like, how do you even, you know? So the mind should be controlled. And Srila Prabhupada, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he made it so easy in this age. Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalau Nast Eva, Nast Eva, Nast Eva, Gatira Nyata. That just chant the holy names of Krishna. And it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you are practicing Christianity, if you're practicing Islam, if you're practicing Buddhist. Anyone can chant this uh, mantra, this Maha Mantra. My spiritual teacher, he asked me, a few days ago, what is one of your favorite pastimes in the Srimad Bhagavatam? And I told them the sixth canto. There's the story of a Brahmin, this educated young man named Ajamil. Do you guys know this pastime? Ajamil. So Ajamil, in his younger years, he was very, he was a Brahmin, you know, he was very dutiful, things like that. They had all good qualities. But one day when he was collecting firewood in the forest, he saw a, what we call a low-class woman, a prostitute. And she was embracing a man. And they were basically uh, having uh, intercourse in the forest. And a jawmill, he tried his best not to think of it. But lusty desire in the heart is very strong. There was a king. And one of his friends was on his deathbed. And he said, when is uh, lusty desires, when are they going to go away? He said, even until the time the, at your uh, deathbed, it still be there. So he said, prove it. So this king brought his young daughters with them to visit. And this old man on the deathbed, he was looking at the daughters like that. So lust is... Krishna describes it's like fire. It burns like fire, and it's never uh, saturated. So anyway, um, I was telling this, uh, this young boys that the mind should be controlled, and one of them is getting these books. <laughs> and he said, what are these books going to do? So I said, these books are so practical. They're not just like you know, books where you read and you put down. But if you apply it in life, you'll see a big difference in one's consciousness, the way you see yourself, that you see the, uh, the world, everything. And the Bhagavad Gita here is actually a call for action. It's not meant just to read and then you forget about, but you apply it in life. So Jamil, he became uh, attached to this prostitute, and he was hunting for her, like looking for her. 
And it's described that even when he was 80 years old, he had a little boy, a little child. So, you know, in Vedic culture, when you're 50 years old, you start detaching from the you know, material life. And you start focusing on spiritual life. And Ajamil, he forgot all about spiritual life, and he was so entangled with this woman. And you can imagine he had 10 children. He had to beg, borrow, steal anyway to uh, provide for these kids. And at the end of his life, there's these uh, representatives of the Lord of Death. His name is Yamaraj. Yamaraj sang, uh, sorry, they're called the Yamadutas. And they went to go see a Jamil. They were going to bring his soul, drag his soul to hell. And out of affection, he called out to his youngest son, Narayan, which is another name for Krishna. And as soon as he chanted Narayan, the Vishnu Dutas came. And they had a conversation. you know. And so Ajamil was saved just by chanting this name of Krishna, Narayan. What to speak of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's described that it's... Uh, what is it? A thousand Vishnu is one name of Ram, and three names of Ram is equal to one name of Krishna. Pretty amazing, huh? So anyway, in this world there's a propaganda. Get as much as you can while you can. Bernard Muni, one of the great saints in the Shrima Bhagavatam, he was walking one day, and he saw the two sons of Kuvera, the treasure for the demigods. And they were sporting in the waters with some damsels, and they were naked. You know. And when they saw Narada Muni, they, didn't, they were so intoxicated, they didn't cover up. But the ladies, they had the intelligence to cover themselves. So Narada Muni, he says, Asita Sri Madandasya. Um, What's the other word? Daridriyam param agyanam. He says that wealth blinds a person, but poverty restores his ability to see. You know, how many people, they are just so bewildered once they get wealth, material wealth. And the thing with wealth is that it diminishes the more you give. That's why people don't like charity. <laughs> I was listening to a class, and there was this sannyasi, this um, monk, older monk. And he was asking for a donation for our books. And this store owner threw coins at him. He said, here. You know, they're willing to spend so much on themselves, but when it comes to some you know, saintly person trying to help them, that's how they treat them. So this is called Kali Yuga. In Vedic culture, whenever... Uh, someone like a sannyasi or someone from the renounced order of life, when they came to your home, you would respect them, you know. You would try to, to get some instructions from them. How do I disentangle myself from this web of, you know, material um, family life and this and that? You know, a, a silkworm, it's interesting, a silkworm creates a cocoon for itself. And then once it's in the cocoon, you can't get out. So material life, family life is like that. You know, without no knowledge of spiritual life, that's just, you, that's just what you focus on. My wife, my kids, my job, my home, my car, this. And then you just, you're just creating your own uh, you know, cocoon. So Narumuni, he cursed his two sons to become trees. But it's actually a blessing. Now, sometimes curses are blessings, but we don't see it. And it's described in the Nectar of Devotion. The happiness derived from pure devotional service is the highest, because it is eternal. You know, they say don't give up the permanent for the temporary, or you lose both. So we need to find a balance in life. But this world, it's... Uh, one-sided, meaning they focus more on material life. That's why it's not really fair, you know. How many people are here? 
You guys want to guess? 60 people. 60 people. Out of all the residents of PB, San Diego, they're here. <laughs> so that's very rare. But actually, it says that Krishna can award liberation to everyone. Liberation from this material existence. But he doesn't award devotional service very easily. So devotional service is very rare. And all of us, just by hearing Krishna, that this is part of devotional service. There's nine processes, and hearing is considered to be the topmost. You know, everyone's so proud of um, the person that they see in the mirror. You know, look at me, I'm very handsome, I'm very beautiful, this and that. But this body one day is going to come to an end. And I've heard there's four ways of getting rid of this body. One is being a fertilizer. You know? <laughs> the second one is under the ground. The third one is cremation. And the fourth one I heard is called the sky burial. They chop up the body and then they feed to vultures. You know? So this body, what is it? Um, so the first thing that we teach is that we're not this body. We're something within the body, something divine, and that is the soul. The soul is eternally part and parcel of Krishna. That relationship between Krishna and the souls, the living entities, it can never be broken, but it can be forgotten. That's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Raja Vidya Rajam Raja Guyam Pavitra Mida Muttamam Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmam Susukam Kartumavyam. Krishna describes that the science of the soul to the Supreme is the king of knowledge, the king of education, and is the purest knowledge. And because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. Now this word religion. You know, many people cringe, you know, oh, I hate religion. People say, oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not, you know, to religion. But Srila Prabhupada explained it in a very beautiful way. He says that religion just means to love and to understand God. And whether you follow the Quran, the Bible, Bhagavad Gita, if it teaches you love of God, then it's perfect. Srila Prabhupada never wanted to convert people, but, you know, there's people that are looking for a more deeper understanding of God, and that's the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, trying to stay on time, guys. So between life and death is a life of deeds. You know, in this life, there's the laws of karma, and karma is one of the laws of nature, and it's very strict. We cannot avoid this law of karma. And the laws of karma, it doesn't excuse a little boy or a little child. For example, fire. The fire doesn't excuse anyone. It burns anyone, whoever it touches. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Muslim, fire will act. So similarly, the laws of karma is still going to act. So whether one believes in karma, reincarnation, it's going to happen. And Krishna talks about this other law, the, la the law of the last thought. Um, how does it go? Yam yam vapismaram bhavam tyajitante kalevaram tam tamivati konteya sadatad bhava bhavata. Krishna says whatever state of being one remembers at the time of death, he attains that without fail. So the last thought that we have before leaving this body is very, very important. You know, Srila Prabhupada, he says if we're thinking of a dog, the soul transmigrates to a dog's body. And if we're thinking about a woman, we get a woman's body. If a person is thinking about a man, they get a man's body. And it's very scientific, it's not wishful thinking, but it makes sense. In this world, we're so attached to so many things. And if we're attached to some bodily feature, and Krishna welcomes that desire. See, Krishna is very kind. Since Krishna is in the heart of every living entity, he, can, he understands our desire. 
whether we want to serve him or we want to serve his external energy, illu- uh, Maya, this illusory energy. So the last thought before we leave this world, you know, Krishna consciousness or ISKCON or this Hare Krishna movement is meant to prepare us for that final uh, day, you know. For some reason, growing up, I was always fascinated by death. You know, is that weird? Because I always knew we're, we're going to die one day. You know, but I was so interested. You know, what happens after we die? Is there death? Is there life after death? You know, how can someone be so sinful and they go to heaven? Like, you know, I was I was asking things like this. So the Bhagavad Gita answered that. Not only that, but we also. It says that the results of our actions in our previous life are called fate. So we cannot uh, control our fate, that's already determined, but the actions that we're performing now, that's called destiny. So we can change our destiny, you know. And Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Sarva dharman parityaja, ma mekam sharanam vraja, aham tam sarva papebhyo, moksha yashami masucha. Krishna is saying, abandon all of these different forms of dharma or religion and just take shelter of Krishna. Masuchaha, do not fear. And he'll deliver us from all of these sinful reactions. You know, in this life, we can see some of the results of our sinful activities. In the nectar of devotion, Srila Rupa Goswami, he says that if one is born in a very unhealthy state, that's a result of our uh, past karma. If one is born into a very poverty-restricted uh, condition, as part of our previous uh, deeds, and if someone is not intelligent, this is one of the results of our uh, previous activities. But then we can see the, the good results in this life. If someone is very beautiful, they were a very pious person in the previous life. If a person is born into a wealthy family, they're a very good person in the pre- previous life. And if someone was born very intelligent, you know, like Einstein, <laughs> you know, I saw this video, this, I don't know, maybe Chinese little baby. She was able to solve a Rubik's Cube. Has anyone played with the Rubik's Cube before? Have you solved it, Eric? No. no. But this little girl, you know, because kids, they think of it as just a game, you know. So similarly, these are the results of our uh, previous life. And, you know, one may not be inclined to practicing devotional service or spiritual life, but due to the mercy of a devotee, you know, they can introduce him to Krishna consciousness. See, Krishna consciousness is very, very rare. And to have this... um, Unmotivated uh, love for Krishna is very, very rare in this world. Okay. You know, a lot of respectful, uh, successful people, they understand that time is very essential, so they don't waste time. But in Kali Yuga, people are experts at wasting time. You know, um, these iPhones or whatever phone, it tells you your, what is it called, screenplay? Screen time. Screen time. There's this, this lady that I met today. She said every day she's on her phone for eight hours. That's like a job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, Pariksit Maharaj, one of the kings in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he was cursed to die in seven days. In seven days, he didn't waste any time. He spent the whole seven days just hearing about Krishna. How, and he started asking wonderful questions. How should one leave this world? What should one think of at the time of death? And the sages that was around the assembly, they congratulated this king. He said, dear king, your question benefits everyone. So he didn't waste any time. And for seven days, Pariksit Maharaj, he was just hearing about Krishna, devotional services, devotees. And he says that he didn't even sleep, drink, or eat. He just fasted, you know. 
And at the seventh day, he left this world in a very wonderful way. He went back to Krishna, back to Godhead. Krishna describes that in the spiritual world, you know, everybody likes to play. Nobody likes to work, you know. So in the spiritual world, in Goloka Vrindavan, we're there just playing with Krishna all day and all night, you know. There is eternally present. And I heard that in the spiritual world, every step is a dance, every word is a song, and every day is a festival. That's our real home, and we should invest in that. In this, in this world, everything's temporary, everything's flickering. And this material happiness is described like a, like a, a drop of water on a lotus leaf. It's just tottering, you know. You tilt it a little bit and just slides off. Okay. And also, association is very important. Who do we surround ourselves with? It says that a friend is tested in, is tested in adversity. A hero is tested in war. An honest person when in debt. A wife in times of poverty. And relatives in times of distress. No. When we have a lot of money, everyone's our friend. When we don't have money, who's there for us? You know. Srila Prabhupada, he took this, this great effort to come to the West. He didn't have to, like he was in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is considered to be the, you know, the spiritual world. And he left that, 16, 69 years old, to come to this Western country. And he saw how materially motivated we were. In one of his letters um, coming here, he says, um, the people here, describing uh, New York, the people here are, what's the right word, absorbed in material consciousness. And they think themselves to be very happy. So how can I spread this message of Vasudev? You know. yeah, he was an old man. He had two heart attacks on his way here. He had no money, no association, but he made it. You know. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we should invest some of our time, and it's very easy. Just get beads, japa beads, mala beads, and start chanting. You can come to the temple whenever you have time, do some service, you know. When I first came to the temple, like everybody, <laughs> There's one service that's very pleasing to everybody. Do you know what that service was? Washing pot washing. <laughs> it's described, it actually cleans the heart, and that's what it is. You know, nobody, anyway, so that's another story. So we should invest some of our time in Krishna consciousness and in devotional service. We should associate with the devotees. We should ask questions. And we should ask questions in, in a very um, submissive way, not in a challenging way. Okay, that's the best I can do. Are there any questions or comments here? Yes, Nelson Prabhu? I'd love to hear some Christmas tradition stories if you have any. Okay. So I was... Uh, Two summers ago, I was wearing a hat that said, Go Loka. It's one of my favorite pastimes. And this young girl, she just took a set of books, you know. And she said, excuse me, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And she said, what is Go Loka? What is that on your, on your hat? I said, Go Loka is our spiritual home. That's where we belong. And I was describing how the spiritual world, Krishna says, it's not illuminated by the sun, moon, fire, electricity. It's self-effulgent. And I said, there, you know, we're always have. I was describing all these wonderful qualities of Goloka Vrindavan. And then I, before she left, she smiled and she said, see you in Goloka. <laughs> so she understood this world is not where, this world is not where we belong. Um... There's a pastime of King Indra. King Indra was the king of heaven. You can imagine the opulence of this king. 
and due to his offense to the spiritual teacher, he was cursed to take the body of a hog. Now hogs, they're not very clean animal. So in a way, he spent his life here as a hog. He found a she-hog, they had piglets, you know. And then one day, Lord Brahma came to him and said, Dear King, the post of heaven, it's uh, unoccupied, and you should return back to your original position. And King Indra, he rejected this offer. He said, how can I leave my family? How can I leave my kids? And he's in filth. You know, he's rolling in mud and eating all this crazy, abominable stuff. And he refused to go back to heaven. So that is our position. Instead of wanting to go back to Krishna, to the spiritual world, we want to stay here. Where there's four miseries, birth, old age, disease, and death. So a sane and intelligent person, they want to get out of here. Please take me, you know. So, um, and then there's another story. I was at uh, the harbor. You guys know the harbor? Seaport Village? Okay. So there was this man, this young man. He was, you know, handsome, you know, American. And so I called him over. I said, what do you got? You know, he was smoking a cigarette right in front of me. <laughs> I said, what are you waiting for? He said, I'm waiting for the party, you know, the girls, you know, the drinks, this and that. So I told him this law of the last thought, you know. If you're thinking of a woman at the time of death, you get a body of a woman. And that shook him, you know. He understood how attached he was to women, you know. And it's described that for men, the female, uh, the female body is what's binding us to this material world. And I also told him that. And he said, oh, shoot, you know. He didn't say shoot, but he said the S word, you know. <laughs> so he threw his uh, cigarette away. And I said, do you have more of this, you know. So I said, I, I have this book for you. It's called Coming Back, The Science of Reincarnation. And he took the book. I asked for a donation to help with the printing. He gave a donation. And he took the book. And while he was waiting for his friends, he was actually reading this book, Coming Back. And another thing that I can remember, you know, on book distribution, there's a lot of stories like that. But there was this one person, he had his hands in his pocket, he was walking by. And I just called him out of nowhere and I said, I have a book for you. I gave him a book, it's called Hiding in Unnatural Happiness. He didn't exchange any words with me, he just took the book and left, you know. And after a few hours later, he came back and he said, why did you call me? Actually, very aggressively, you know, why did you call me out of all people? And I said, I just wanted to help. And then he explained that he was actually going to go kill himself. Like, you don't know what people are thinking, you know. So he said, after reading this book, I don't want to do that, you know. So Srila Prabhupada's books, his disciples, these books, they create a revolution in the heart. They help people to find uh, meaning and purpose, you know. And these uh, two Matsujis here, one of their service is um, wrapping, gift wrapping, putting them in a ribbon as a stack, you know, like a set. Sometimes five, six books. And people that I meet, they love these books. They know someone who can benefit from these books. They know someone who wants to read these books. So there was one lady that I met. She was with her mom. And she said, you know, I love what you do, but I could never do this. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I can't talk to strangers, you know. And I said, I love talking to people, you know. It doesn't seem like it. I'm a very shy person. But when it comes to distributing books, I, I can talk for hours, you know. Uh, Vijay Prabhu, His Grace Vijay Prabhu, he's one of my inspiration. And I always say that he can sell salt to a slug. You know, a slug... You know, it's very, uh, salt is very poisonous for a, a snail or a slug, you know. But he's so talented, he can sell <laughs> salt to a slug. So similarly, I, I attained this uh, mentality, you know. Whoever you meet, just share them um, Krishna consciousness. Share them that there's another way of life, not just struggling through life, you know. Trying to get your rent paid, trying to this, that, you know. 
The human form of life is different from that of an animal's. Human beings, we have the ability to speak. And Srila Prabhupada says religion is what makes us and animals different. Are there any cats or dogs in here? No. See? And we're human beings. So, um, that's one of those Sankirtan stories. Any other questions or? Yes, Prabhu. Um, Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, I, I understand that whatever at the last minute, like when our soul leaves the body, whatever we think, that's the body we will take. Mm -hmm. And what I'm not able to understand is uh, the rationale or the logic behind that. What I'm trying to get is, for example, right, uh, we are completely chanting Hare Rama Hare Krishna because we don't want to take a rebirth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at the last minute when you're walking in a road and even when you're chanting uh, and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden some heart attack or something comes. I'm just giving a situation just yeah. to explain my question. And when that happens, assume a horse running in front of you and then you turn the side and then your soul leaves. Just a situation. So in this case, what is the rationale behind that? Uh, why Krishna said like that? I'm curious. So there's a pastime of uh, Ma Bharat Maharaj. You know, he was practicing, he was at the stage of bhava, very high level. But then he was attached to a deer. And at the time of life, he took the body of a deer. But Krishna says, Krishna promises that whatever endeavor we have um, in Krishna consciousness, it goes to our eternal bank account. And Krishna is very kind and merciful, you know. You know, accidents do happen. But... Just like I was saying, investing in chanting has so much benefits, but we don't know it, you know, it's inconceivable. My spiritual teacher used this example. If you're in the car and you're going 100 miles an hour, hopefully none of you drive that fast. But 100 miles per hour, do you feel like you're going 100? No. See? So one who's practicing devotional service, we're going very fast, we're advancing so fast, but we don't... We don't feel it, we don't see it, you know. But to answer your question, um, well, this chant Hare Krishna. You know, Srila Prabhupada in that purport of uh, 8.6, he says a person will naturally think of what's prominent to him, a person. Whatever he feels like is most dear to him, they naturally think of at the time of death. So in this life, if we're practicing devotional service, we be, we depend on we're depending on Krishna, and also uh, chanting Hare Krishna. It's not just to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He says he doesn't even want liberation. See? He doesn't want salvation. He just wants to take birth after birth after birth, if he can remember Krishna. So a devotee, we're not even concerned about liberation. The purpose of chanting Hare Krishna is purifying the heart and developing love of God. That's actually higher than uh, salvation or liberation. Because it's not, it's, it follows, uh, liberation follows uh, prema. So, you know, you're a devotee, you don't have anything to worry about. You know. Hare Krishna. That's why the form of God is so important. A lot of uh, religions, they have this impersonal aspect of God. He has no form, you know, this and that. But how can we think of God if He has no form? If we have form and God doesn't have form, that means that we have something that God doesn't have. That means we're greater than God and we don't accept that. If you look at Krishna, Krishna means the all-attractive Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna has two hands, two feet. But everything about Krishna is very beautiful. It's described that, you know, people wear jewelry so they can look nice. But Krishna beautifies the jewelry. <laughs> That's how wonderful and sweet Krishna is, you know. And this is our eternal father, you know. So I hope that answers your question. Mukunda, do you have so many aspects? Yes. Thank you, Govardhan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So next, I'll just give some announcements. Yes, you can have to go. Thank you.